Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Good Wednesday, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It's the 7th of June, and as always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local weather information. You can do that several ways. Give us a call on the Alaska Weather Information Line, 1-800-472-0391. Find us online at weather.gov slash Alaska, or send us a note, and we'd be happy to explain what we're seeing there if you've got a special uh, situation or uh, just can't find what you're looking for, we're happy to help. David.Snyder at NOAA.gov is the easy way to reach me and ask questions about anything you found. Now, if you haven't checked lately, aviators especially, you'll want to go to weather.gov slash AAWU. That's the new Alaska Aviation Weather Unit website, and it is going to look a lot different than what you've been used to for many, many years. What we're trying to do is make sure that all the pieces that you know and love from the old site are going to make it to the new site and that they work similar ways or uh, do similar things. That process is ongoing there and we keep working with you, uh, thanks to many of your suggestions, to, to get that to work just the way you'd like it to, to look and appear and in something that's easily uh, used and uh, mobile friendly as well. So make sure you check that out, weather.gov slash AAWU if you haven't used that yet. And then if you don't like what you see, you can't find what you're looking for, or you've got some helpful suggestions, please let us know. You can email me here, uh, but there's also an email link on that new page. Uh, the old web page will be up for a couple more weeks, so make sure you check that out soon. Here's a look at the weather headlines. Rivers are rising across interior Alaska. Why would that be? It's been hot. Uh, warm temperatures there and a higher freezing level across the interior, especially across the Alaska Range, is getting rid of a lot of that snowpack in rapid form. We're not expecting any major flooding, but you might lose some of those uh, gravel bars that you like to land on in some of your favorite spots. So uh, just keep an eye on changing conditions there in the river. Some of those rivers uh, might reach bank full in the next week or so. Uh, keep an eye on that and watch for more information from the National Weather Service office in Fairbanks. They are watching that closely. Areas of smoke will also be watched uh, carefully from our interior weather forecast office, uh, especially along the middle of Yukon and the Koyukuk Valleys. In those areas, uh, there is, uh, with the southerly flow, uh, we're expecting to see some areas of smoke across those regions there. So uh, places like Galena, uh, we'll be looking at uh, increased chances of seeing smoke uh, passing through the area from time to time. Uh, changing weather could make that worse or even better. Interior thunderstorms are also going to increase the fire danger over the next uh, several days there. We are watching uh, places like uh, the Copper River Basin as well uh, to see if hot, dry, windy conditions uh, will ex exacerbate the fire risk that's already there. As we head toward the weekend, of course, and more people are using campfires uh, to get out and enjoy the outdoors of Alaska a little bit more, uh, that risk, of course, grows. So be extra careful with fire. Make sure that your campfire is out before you break camp and leave. Stir it, wash it down, stir it again, and wash it down some more. Uh, make sure that sucker's out. And then, of course, uh, make sure that you report any wildfire uh, immediately. Uh, call 911 with that information and uh, be extra careful as you're out and about uh, with ATV and OTV vehicles. Here's a look at the fire danger as it stands right now. Uh, generally along and north of the Yukon Valley is where we're seeing some of the highest fire danger at this point. That extends out into the Seward Peninsula as well as the Kotzebue Sound region, up around the Kobuk and Noatak Valleys, the upper ends as well, and around the middle Tanana Valley and westward uh, downriver there into the, uh, well not quite as far as the upper Kuskokwim, but you get the drift a little bit around Tanana and westward. Also across extreme western parts of the YK Delta region we're looking at higher than usual fire weather conditions. And that's simply because we haven't had widespread wet weather. Once we get out of uh, July and into August, things start to change a little bit. But you'll notice this is where we've got fire conditions right now and ongoing fires as well as areas around uh, Toke and uh, the Richardson Highway. So uh, conditions are certainly there and there are several fires ongoing across Alaska. You can check out the Alaska Information uh, the Coordination Center. Uh, page for the very latest uh, count of fires across the region. But uh, your job, of course, is to be careful with fire where you are. 
Here's a look at the satellite picture and uh, low pressure across the central and eastern Gulf is drawing up a wide swath of moisture across southeast and yet it has been a warm day. Our friends watching the weather in Hyder, all 82 something of you, report that it is uh, a warm day, about 82 degrees or so in Hyder and probably about the same just across the line over in Stewart. Uh, so 82, I believe that is the warmest temperature in the state of Alaska today and just barely so of course, we know where you're located. Uh, but 82 degrees is a pretty good, uh, pretty good temperature considering you've got so many, so many clouds in the vicinity. Obviously, they're not parked right over you. They're not pouring down rain or snow, as it were. But, uh, oh gosh, an 82 degree day in Hyder. That's something to write home about for sure. Low pressure will continue that southerly and warm flow over southeast. And uh, if it creeps eastward just a little bit, you'll have a much better chance of cooling that down and adding some precipitation uh, to your weather picture. And there is a wet spot in Alaska today. That would be Whittier. They picked up about an inch and a third or so, I believe, across uh, uh, the 24-hour period there. And uh, Kobuk, Kobuk, or Koyuk, I should say. Koyuk was up to 79 today. So that heat is also working its way north and west into the western and interior parts of Alaska. So a very, very warm day for many locations across interior, across southeast, across south central. Mild weather today. And you can see some clouds across the Alaska Peninsula. Not a whole lot going on underneath that, but uh, because of the warm weather, because of the moisture and the instability in the atmosphere, thunderstorms once again across southwestern Alaska have been growing. And you can see that firing up across some of the south and western areas late this afternoon. This line of showers and thunderstorms will continue tracking westward. But remember, if this is not a weather situation that you're very used to, or perhaps you just haven't thought about it for a while yet, uh, as soon as you hear uh, thunder, that's a good sign that you are in range of being struck by lightning. It doesn't mean it's going to happen, of course, and the chances are generally pretty low. But if you can hear thunder, you're within the radius of danger, and it's time to go inside and seek shelter, moving away from uh, anything that's metal or an electrical appliance in your home. So you can do the math. It's about a five-second rule. If you can count to 1-1,000, 2-1,000, 3-1,000, 4-1,000, 5-1,000, that's a mile between you and the lightning strike. So watch for the strike, count to five, and that's one mile. You need to let that grow, though, to about uh, 10 miles so that you're outside of that generally accepted safe distance from a lightning strike. So uh, that's how you know uh, you can uh, get your safe distance away. If you're within that, you need to be in some shelter and uh, waiting about 30 minutes or so until the last from the last time that you've heard uh, the thunder or seen the lightning strike. So five seconds a mile. Here's a look at the visible satellite picture, and uh, if you look northward, you can also see clouds growing up around the uh, south slopes of the Brooks Range, north of the Yukon Valley there. Uh, that's all because of this wavy black line. That is a trough, or in this case, it's a thermal trough generated low pressure because of the heating of the day. And those temperatures across that region right in here have reached into the 70 and 80 degree range once again. Across the Gulf, uh, warm air is lifting northward, mixing up with some of the cold air. We'll call that an occluded front. As that pushes northward, it has brought and focused some rain across Prince William Sound today. Not a very nice day there at all. And out across the eastern Gulf Coast, but not over southeast yet, uh, areas of rain and changing winds. Out west, a new wave of low pressure working into the western Aleutians, but it has a ridge of high pressure to break through before it swings eastward, so it may just sit out there and kind of uh, weaken substantially. We've air added our areas of smoke in here across the middle Yukon Valley and the Koyukuk Valley. Across south central, pockets of showers are possible tonight. Uh, we've seen some of that in the Anchorage and, uh, region as well as the valleys. And across south and eastern Alaska, don't be surprised to run into some rain. Your very warm day could certainly uh, make that possible. For Thursday afternoon, the front will kind of reorganize a little bit across southeast and the Pacific Northwest and will hover across the eastern Gulf. And we expect another round of showers and thunderstorms to be possible across the upper Kuskokwim, as well as the lower Kuskokwim and parts of the YK Delta as we get into Thursday. Most areas across the interior will be watching waves of clouds move from east to west, and we expect showers across Prince William Sound, uh, the central chain, and areas across the western chain. But high pressure is pretty much in control of the Bering Sea. So what does that mean? Low stratus and fog uh, for uh, most of your Thursday there. Fog also across the north slope with generally drier conditions as we go into Friday. Uh, fog will be lurking closer to the coast. One thing that will be changing for you across uh, many parts of the Chukchi Sea is the open water that continues to expand north, west, and gradually eastward uh, that is now uh, working its way east of Barrow. 
Showers and thunderstorms are expected across the western Alaska range and westward as we head into Friday. Some of that could reach into Norton Sound as well as the Kotzebue Sound region and most of the Seward Peninsula. Nome looking at a chance of showers there. I also wouldn't be surprised to see thunderstorms popping up across western portions of Yukon and uh, getting fairly close to the Copper River Basin. Remember, that's where we were saying uh, there's a possibility for some higher than usual fire danger there. So we'll be watching that carefully. And pockets of rainfall across southeast and the northern Gulf Coast with high pressure, though, moving into the eastern Gulf. Instead of widespread areas of low pressure, this could kind of reorganize the weather picture a little bit. So perhaps uh, decreasing chances of rainfall as we get into Friday there. And low pressure south and west of Sand Point at 989 millibars will be trying to work its way into the Gulf. But once again, high pressure is in charge here, so it's going to have to work into that weaken or move southward. Here's a look at temperatures today. 50s and 60s under areas of heavier cloud cover and uh, cooler winds, but there's our friends in Hyder there. 81 degrees on this count. It was uh, 82 from our uh, co-op observer friend there. Thank you very much for your service, and we appreciate the information all the time. That is very helpful. 40s and 50s across Prince William Sound. Middleton Island was down to a cooler 48. 61 in Anchorage, 47 in Kodiak today. 60s and 70s as you get into the middle Tanana Valley. 78 in Eagle. It was in the 70s there for Fort Yukon this afternoon. 63 in Arctic Village. and Anuktuvik Pass was 52. 30s for most of the eastern in central Beaufort Sea Coast, Barrow was 31. Kotzebue Sound temperatures ranged from the 40s, out closer to the ice and the water, to the mid-70s once you got into Kotzebue. 64 in, uh, looks like, uh, Nome, uh, 75 around Galena. Again, watching for smoke there. And it uh, looks like McGrath was also a toasty day at 75. 64 in Bethel, 50 for Nunavak Island. 40s for St. Lawrence Island, St. George, and St. Paul. And 40s and 50s for the Alaska Peninsula with Cold Bay and False Pass and Sand Point. Uh, also, some of the slightly warmer days there. 51 for Unalaska and Dutch Harbor, and it was in the lower to mid-40s for uh, Atu as well as Adak and Atka. Now, overnight, low temperatures will stay mild in the lower 50s for many across west and central interior locations. 20s and 30s for the North Slope, South Central in the 40s and 50s, Southeast in the lower 50s for you. The Alaska Peninsula and the chain, as well as the Priblovs in the 30s and 40s tonight. Gnome, you're looking at 49 and a high of 70 tomorrow. Fairbanks has you beat, as well as Eagle, up to about 80 degrees. Same goes for Tanana and maybe Fort Greeley. South Central in the 60s and 70s tomorrow. The Susitna Valley easily has uh, most of the Kenai Peninsula uh, beat for temperatures with highs there in the mid to upper 70s. In fact, 60s and maybe a few places like Gustavus or perhaps Sitka uh, warming into the upper 60s and low 70s tomorrow. Haines could be a scorcher for you at 78 degrees, 50s and 60s for parts of the Alaska Peninsula, 56 in Kodiak, and mid-40s for Adak and Atka if you're headed that way, 41 around St. Lawrence Island, still holding on to just a scotch of ice across the north and eastern uh, part of the island. IFR conditions for the North Slope will continue generally east of Barrow and around St. Paul and St. George and out across the Gulf. MVFR conditions linger for the central and southern parts of the inner channels and the outer coast of southeast Prince William Sound, southern Cook Inlet, Shelikoff Strait and Kodiak Island, and all of the chain and the Alaska Peninsula. Some improvements there across the Pacific Coast and inside of Shelikoff Strait tomorrow afternoon and across central and southern parts of southeast. You won't see a whole lot of changes there for your visibility northward. It looks okay. Watch for showers and thunderstorms across southwest. And IFR conditions move a little bit further westward toward Barrow as we go through the afternoon. So changing conditions there. Anuktuvik Pass will start at MVFR. Look for VFR conditions through the pass by the afternoon, but just north of uh, the pass exit or entrance, as it were, uh, you would see probably poor conditions developing fairly quickly as you move northward or southward. Things would improve. Uh, VFR conditions also expected to develop right over the pass for Attigan Pass tomorrow. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass will hold at MVFR through most of the day. Rainy Pass, VFR conditions in the morning, but changing conditions in the afternoon for you and for Windy Pass. Uh, watch for Isabel Pass to lean over to MVFR as the day goes on. Mentasta Pass looks pretty good tomorrow. Tanita Pass, we expect to see marginal conditions develop by the afternoon. Portage Pass, rains back in the region again. Marginal conditions at best on the eastern side. And Chilkoot and White Pass, Hot weather and VFR flying for you. Freezing conditions, freezing levels show that the level is up about 10,000 feet across the Yukon and the eastern interior. No surprise with that heat. Uh, look at the levels there across the west. Also above 8,000 feet. So we've got a lot of hot air across the interior and the west and the northwest coast. Changing conditions across the central and western chain. Four to 6,000 foot levels there and eight to 10,000 feet across uh, the uh, central and southern southeastern coastline. Over the Gulf, it goes even lower to at or even below 6,000 feet. Icing potential is going to focus right along that front and across some of the higher terrain for the central and eastern Alaska range. 
Also across the interior, but that's way up there, above 10,000 feet. Across the YK Delta and parts of the Alaska Peninsula between 8 and 9,000 feet and higher. So a lot of this is pretty high level stuff and right now it's looking at light to isolated moderate. Uh, looks like tomorrow's jet stream is still doing that crazy snake across uh, uh, most of Alaska. You can see the Pacific jet is coming in from the north before it ever reaches into Alaska waters. We've got our ridge building across the central Aleutians and then wrapping into the Pacific Northwest. But wait a minute, it's going to cut back to the west and then cut back to the east. So we've got a lot of weird uh, uh, circulations here. But the main flow is still well to our south and then it grabs whatever moisture it can and slings that back into the northern Gulf. And then this is locking in the heat from the continental parts of Canada and the lower parts of the United States. So uh, we've got a little bit of everything. But we generally have an easterly flow working through uh, the uh, western Yukon into the central and western interior. So that is keeping the heat in charge. Low pressures in the Gulf. Wind speeds near the Gulf 20 to 35. Wind speeds in the interior 15 to 20. And light northerly flow at 9,000 feet across the north slope. At 3,000 feet, very similar conditions easterly is pretty much though from top to bottom. Uh, 20 to 30 knots across the north, 5 to 15 across south central, southeast 20 to 25 for the west coast, anywhere from 5 to 10 across the southwest, and then a little bit higher across the west and northwest, 20 to 25 there, but all generally due east. Turbulence potential will focus across the north and eastern Gulf below 4,000 feet. Watch for some occasional chop there. And across the north, a little bit more of a focus uh, west of uh, Fairbanks and uh, south of Fairbanks as well across the higher terrain, but generally below 5,000 feet. Watch for occasional chop across the north slope. That's a look at your aviation forecast. I'll be back with the rest of your marine weather here in just a few minutes. Hello again, I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service with another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. And joining me today are not just one, but two people, both with the last name Stevens, which is even more fun, but no relation. We have Eric Stevens mm -hmm. from Gina mm -hmm. and George Stevens, who is a mechanical engineering student from the University of mm -hmm. Alaska Fairbanks. Did I get that right? Yep. Awesome. And today you guys brought a really cool toy or I should say tool with you. It's a sandbox. But why are you guys working on a sandbox? Well, it's part of our senior design project, and we were approached by um, EPSCOR to build, build this from, for them. Mm -hmm. They uh, uh, had a proof of concept that they developed years, years, about a year ago, I think, and um, the, uh, uh, they wanted a more robust ver version that they mm -hmm. could pack onto a plane and take places. And it's a handy learning tool for kids and, all, and adults. So you're a mechanical engineering student. You've built a traveling sandbox for the experimental program to stimulate competitive research EPSCOR, and Gina's facilitated this. But why do we need a traveling sandbox? Well, the, the uh, prototype was such a big hit that uh, they decided they wanted another one, actually two, that, they could act that would be easier to travel with, you know, um, possibly marketable even. Okay, so this is a traveling sandbox that's got a lot of bits and pieces and, and a computer hooked up to it. What is the computer doing with the sand? The computer actually uses a Kinect sensor to read the topography of the sand or the shape of the sand, mm -hmm. which, and then the computer translates that into information which it projects using a projector onto the sand showing topographical lines and which is representative of the shape of the sand. Okay, so this is a live mapping tool? Yeah. It's interactive. As you're moving your hands through it, it is actively following and changing the lines to fit what you're doing. That sounds like something I could have in my backyard. Yeah. It'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> so you guys had to change the design a little bit to make this more Alaskified, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, how'd you do that? Well, um, the original was made out of basically lumber and Simpson strong tie type mm -hmm. stuff. And we re rebuilt it to make it lighter and basic and basically more transportable we can pack it down to a fairly small size and it can be loaded onto a plane and flown anywhere in the state which you guys did today and you yep. have plans to take this in other places of alaska right yep we're actually going to be headed down to homer with it later today okay very good eric how mm -hmm. does this fit into uh, science learning around alaska well you know what i think it is a tool and it is a toy and yes. it brings out a smile from an eight-year-old oh, yeah. and the smile from a 48-year-old with oh, yeah. that inner eight-year-old yes. wanting to get out. The, uh, the sandbox, it's an interactive learning tool that teaches us how topography in the three dimensions is related to, say, a two-dimensional mm -hmm. map. More about that later. Just like George was saying, it's got a Kinect sensor, not just for video games anymore. It's 
can sense out the the lay of the land there, yeah. feeds that information in the computer, the computer identifies that, sends a signal to a, pro a projector to send topographic land lines to map over that that uh, lumpy ground. So right. you get a three-dimensional topo map out of it. And my favorite thing about it, this is the thing that stops people at the, the trade show, they stop at your booth and, and sure. don't leave, is that you run your hand through that sandbox and it responds in, in real time. It remaps yeah, cool. the, top, the topography as you get to be Mr. Tectonic Plate Drifter <laughs> there. You can make things how you want. Well, what if we made a really high mountain here and a low valley there and the lines adjust to what you did? It's a learning tool because it, it yeah. shows you that connection between these two-dimensional topo lines and, and what's really out in Alaska. And Alaska's a place with all kinds of topography. Mm -hmm. You know, we're from the Great Plains where your topo maps tend to be just like blank pieces of paper, but Alaska is particularly gifted in this regard, and, and this tool helps us, I think, learn more about our state, really. Absolutely, and so this is going to enha enhance uh, STEM learning, the science, technology, engineering, and math in, in many different uh, locations around Alaska, then. This would be something that kids and teachers can get their hands on. Mm -hmm. It sure is, and I mentioned the uh, it's it's like flypaper at a booth that, <laughs> or or at the uh, science potpourri when we had Greg's original version of this sandbox, okay. and that one was made out of scraps of wood, and it, it was a prototype. But even that one, before it had some of the refinements that that George and crew have made for this newer, right. um, upscaled maybe a 2.0 version of the sandbox. Okay. Even that one was so attractive to people. It just demonstrated that this this has potential to be a learning tool, an outreach tool, an education tool um, that can now is portable and can go places in Alaska. Um, of course, there's only one sandbox, can't be everywhere at once, but hopefully it gets out there, gets the word out about EPSCOR and, and what science is being done here for Alaskans. All right, that sounds really interesting, and I can't wait to get my hands in the sand and try this out for myself. Mm -hmm. We're going to demonstrate this here in our next segment of Alaska Weather Facts, but before we go, we want to remind you that EPSCOR, which is a, a new acronym for me now, but I'm going to remember this because you can follow them on Facebook and Twitter, and I invite you to do that. Alaska EPSCOR uh, is also uh, something that facilitates science learning at uh, the University of Alaska around the state, and that stands for Experimental Program to Stimulate Competitive Research. So check that out, and make sure you tune in tomorrow because we're going to have the next version where we actually get our hands in the sand and check out how this works and demonstrates that topography. So for now, I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with this edition of Alaska Weather Facts and we'll see you again next time. And he meant Friday because Thursday's Stargazer because you love Stargazer and that's why we put it on Thursday. Here's a look at uh, today's sea ice edge and you'll notice we've got a lot of heat that's been moving up into the Chukchi Sea, a lot of open water there. Uh, the sea ice free areas now are expanding. We still have a little bit of ice right here on the northeastern corner of St. Lawrence Island. Norton Sound now though officially sea ice free so for the Bering Sea we're almost there, almost there. For southeast you've got light winds across the inner channels 10 to 15 small seas as well. The northern Lynn Canal up to four feet though a northerly wind at 20 knots. Offshore winds from Cross Sound southward to the Dixon entrance 20 to 25, 8 to 9 foot seas there. A little bit more of an onshore flow up around Yakutat on Thursday, but all the winds become southerly across the outer coast on Friday. South and southeasterly winds remain light. Uh, south of Juneau, the Lynn Canal, southerly is 25 knots with a 5 foot sea on Friday. For South Central and inside Prince William Sound, we have light winds. Westerly is 10 knots with a 2 foot sea on Thursday. Light northerly is across the northern Gulf Coast. West and northwesterly is over the Barren Islands. And a light and somewhat variable wind across Cook Inlet with a 10 knot flow. Northwesterly is east of Kodiak Island at 15. That becomes even more light and more variable as we get into Friday. Light northerly winds across the northern Gulf, 15 knots with 3 to 4 foot seas there. Light westerly is on Friday inside of the Sound and small seas. And small seas with a southerly breeze up the Cook Inlet. Oh, that almost rhymed. Across the Alaska Peninsula and inside Bristol Bay we go. Westerly is there, 20 knots with a 4-foot sea on the inside of the bay. 15 to 20 across the Alaska Peninsula's Pacific Coast with 6-foot seas there, 3-foot seas down the Alaska Peninsula's Bering Sea Coast with a 15-knot breeze on Thursday. For Friday, easterlies cut into Bristol Bay, 15 knots with a 3-foot sea, 4-foot seas down the coast with a slightly stronger breeze, and southeasterlies across the Pacific Coast, 20 to 25 with a 7 to 9-foot sea there on Friday there for the Pacific Coast. For the Aleutians, 10 to 15 in all areas with the exception from Kiska to Attu, southerlies there up to 25 knots with a 7-foot sea, 3 to 4-foot seas across the Bering Sea Coast, 5 to 6-foot seas for the Pacific, again with some variability in that wind direction from Unalaska to Nikolsky as we get into Thursday afternoon. 
more of a north and easterly flow as we get into Friday. 15 to 25 knots in the central and eastern chain with 7 to 9 foot seas there. 4 foot seas across the Bering Sea coast and west and northwesterlies from Adak to Kiska and Attu 15 to 20 with a 4 to 5 foot sea there on your Friday afternoon. For the west coast, northerlies are coming across St. Lawrence Island up to 25 knots with a higher sea at 5 feet there. Same goes for St. Matthew, but your winds won't be quite as strong. Northwesterlies north of Nunavak Island, westerlies coming into the Kuskokwim Delta, 20 knots with a 3-foot sea and 4-foot seas around St. Paul and St. George with a light and somewhat variable flow. That won't change very much for Friday, and neither will the winds cutting across St. Lawrence Island. 25 knots there with a 6-foot sea, 4 to 5-foot seas for St. Matthew and areas north of Nunavak Island. Southwesterlies coming into the Kuskokwim Delta now with a 15 knot wind and three foot seas expected for your Friday. For the north slope, easterlies moving across the ice sharply at 25 knots. They'll be even a little bit stronger as you come down across the Chukchi Sea Coast. 30 knots from the east and northeast with seven to eight foot seas. There four foot seas outside of Kotzebue Sound on a northerly 20 knot wind. Look at Friday, much stronger winds across the Chukchi Sea. And remember, a lot of this is open water, so that means we could generate nine to 10 foot seas for your Friday. So watch the rough seas out there as we get into uh, the end of the week. East and northeasterlies will continue over the ice, but uh, again, the ice is breaking up slowly and surely north of Barrow and even east of Barrow. So be careful out there if you're going out on the ice. Here's a look at uh, tonight's forecast once again. We have a wave of low pressure across the eastern gulf. That's gradually going to spread more clouds and perhaps some showers into parts of southeast. Right now, that boundary is sitting right across the coast. It just needs to move a little bit more to include more people in that wet weather fun. But because it didn't, today Hyder made it up to 82 degrees. Low pressure sitting across the lower and middle Yukon Valley. North of that, we expect to see some smoke in the region, places like Galena, for example. South of that, there's a much better chance for showers and maybe a few thunderstorms again through the night. More of that tomorrow, of course across southwest, showers across south central and southeast, and for your Friday, uh, more showers and storms in the interior. Have a good one. See you tomorrow. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.